inventor. To make television, he got himself the lamp from the front of a bicycle, a pair of scissors, a hat box, obviously. Uh, then there's the tea chest in which we find a selection of cotton bobbins and some sealing wax. Then over here we have the glue and the knitting needles. And then when he got himself the lid from a coffin, he was ready to start work. He used the coffin lid as a base. He then took the lid off the hat box, pierced holes through it in a spiral pattern, used a knitting needle as a shaft and turned it into a scanning disc. This converted the object in front of it into a series of lines. The lines of light were then converted into an electrical signal, which could then be transmitted to a light bulb, which shone through a reverse scanning disc, which reconstructed the original picture. Understand that? No, well, nor do I. But it worked. In 1923, Baird managed to transmit the image of a cross. Not exactly the UK's worst toilet, but we're on our way. And Baird was delighted. Unfortunately, however, he wasn't the only one working on the big idea. Over in America, there was a Mormon boy from Idaho called Philo T. Farnsworth. Farnsworth was born in Utah, but in 1918, when young Philo was 11, the family moved here to Rigby, Idaho, which, like Hastings, is proud to call itself the birthplace of television. The family really couldn't afford any books, so he did not have a lot of education. But when they arrived at the ranch in Rigby that had this Delco power plant, he found in the attic of the bungalow ranch a treasure trove of scientific journals and magazines. And it's here that he probably really began to learn about television for the first time. He was probably sitting up one night, flipping through an issue of, of Science and Invention magazine when he came across a story about pictures that could fly through the air. And this was a story that really captivated his imagination. I'm trying to find out. Who is this? Anyone we know? <laughs> <laughs> the two of us. It's the blind leading the blind here. Now in their 90s, Farnsworth's younger sisters have fond memories of their older brother. His mind was an inquiring mind, and he wanted to know what made the world go round. And that's why he, he became an inventor, because he wanted to see what motivated, what made things move. And so that's, that's the kind of a person he was. He, he would say things and we just took his word for everything, didn't we, Laura? Everything he said was right, was correct. Because he said so. Because Philo said so. In 1921, two years before John Logie Baird had his moment of inspiration on the clifftop near Hastings, Farnsworth had a similar epiphany while working in a field. As he looked at the furrows he had just ploughed, he thought, hang on, you could scan an image with electrons if they were in rows like that. Genius. And he was only 14 years old. Farnsworth quickly fleshed out the details and back at school covered his classroom blackboard with his diagrams and equations. And the teacher comes into the room at the end of the day and sees this wild array of diagrams and formulas that he's written on the board. And he says, what does this have to do with chemistry? And Philo puts down his chalk and says, this is my idea for electronic television. And the teacher says, television? What's that? 
What the boy genius drew was the first electronic camera tube. Completely electronic television. There were no spinning discs, no coffin lids, no knitting needles. But of the two systems, only one could survive. And since Baird had actually produced and transmitted an image, he was ahead. Things were looking good for the father of the thermal sock. The cross was the breakthrough Baird needed. It proved his system worked. His father was sufficiently impressed to fund him to the tune of 50 quid. But Baird needed more than just money and set about attracting some outside interest in his invention. So he advertised in the Times. Seeing by wireless, inventor of apparatus wishes to hear from someone who will assist, not financially, in making a working model. He was lucky. His ad was noticed by Cinema Supremo Will Day, and with Day's sponsorship, Baird thought up ways to improve his machine. What he decided is that his new machine needed more power. A lot more. 2,000 volts, in fact. So he went out and bought himself hundreds and hundreds of batteries. Now, bearing in mind his last experiment with electricity had blotted out the Glasgow power supply, this was likely to end in tears. And it did. <coughs> Baird's landlord wasn't at all impressed by the electrocution and quickly evicted the singed Scot. He had no money and things looked bleak. But luckily, his sponsors stuck with him and found him a little attic flat here at 22 Frith Street in the middle of London, Soho. Hi. Double espresso, please. Today, the building's a cafe, which means it survived Baird's tenure. But only just. Although Baird had managed to get an image to appear on his rudimentary television, there were still problems to overcome. The mechanical Nipkoff disc that scanned the image had to be made bigger to get a brighter, clearer picture. So, in his attic, Baird set about the task of making monstrous plywood discs with enormous 8-inch lenses. And at first, it looked like he was onto a winner. Not one to give up, Baird had the bright idea of studying the best lens he could find, the human eye. He fooled the surgeon into thinking he was a fellow doctor and took home a freshly removed eye. Unfortunately, while Baird may have been a fine inventor, he was a hopeless surgeon. And the eye just went squish. Fortunately for the Scot, on the other side of the Atlantic, the young American lad, Farnsworth, hadn't got very far developing his idea either. He was the eldest in the family, and when his father died in 1924, he had to give up his education, put his television dream on hold, and find work to support the rest of the family. While Farnsworth faltered, Baird was preparing to trial the latest version of his television. But first he needed some dummy to sit in front of his camera. Now this is a Stooky Bill. Uh, it's actually a ventriloquist dummy's head that Baird um, purchased off a market stall to replace a human sitting in front of it because his original camera was so insensitive that he poured more and more light onto the object he was televising until he got to the point where he, on one occasion, set fire to someone's hair. So here we have Stooky Bill sitting in front of a spinning disc. In October 1925, with a final flurry of twisting knobs and crossing fingers, Baird at last managed to get an image of the dummy's face on his television. 
was in shades of grey rather than just black and white, and this was a major step forward. But it wasn't enough for Baird. He was determined to see a human face.